Fletcher Building's major project, the International Convention Centre, continues to rack up millions in costs. How long to go until it can finally wash its hands of the losses? I think the, the Convention Centre is really frustrating. Um, and I, and I, th well, I think we're doing a good job to finish off. It's still hurting everybody, the business and shareholders. It's Monday the 21st of August and you're watching Markets with Madison. Investors are no doubt still scarred from Fletcher Building piling up almost a billion dollars in shock losses in 2016 and 2017. Five years later, and it's still facing cost blowouts on major projects. And now it's also facing economic uncertainty, with the housing market at the behest of higher interest rates. Fletcher's is our nation's largest builder, behind many of the great structures we enjoy today, including Auckland's landmark, the Sky Tower, the capital's Cake Tin and Te Papa Museum. But it just reported a 45% drop in its bottom line to profit $235 million off $8.5 billion in revenue. The drop was largely due to big one-off costs related to the Sky City International Convention Centre. I'll explain that more in a moment, but first let's take a look at its operating structure. It's a big business, so big it separates itself into six divisions. Building products, which is made up of jib plasterboard Laminex New Zealand, steel, pipes and roofing. Distribution, which includes placemakers. Concrete, with the cement brands Winston Aggregates, Golden Bay, Firth and Humes. Residential and development includes Auckland and Christchurch home builders Fletcher Living and Vivid Living, as well as Clever Core, which manufactures prefab homes. Construction, well that's self-explanatory, we've all seen the lion in the sky on big projects. But this core division also spans the Pacific Islands and includes Higgins, the road builder, and Brian Perry Civil, which has engineering capability. Australia is run as a business division, it covers products, manufacturing and distribution. They've all had their own challenges. Its Australia water pipes business is under investigation for possible leaky issues. The jib crisis here had all eyes on Fletcher's dominance in the building products market and how much it's charging. It's about to open this new jib factory in Tauranga. Its construction division literally went up in flames. Its major international convention sector project for Sky City is still in repair mode after an accidental fire in October 2019. By my count, the project is now costing a billion dollars to complete, from an initial 750 million. The latest update from Fletcher says it expects to finish it in early 2025 or sooner. Another one of its major plagued projects was the $1 billion commercial bay shopping precinct and PwC Tower in downtown Auckland. They completed it in 2020, but not without a legal fight with the owner. On top of all that, it's currently facing a class action lawsuit from investors who've taken issue over its financial failures and its building division between 2016 and 2017, a period that saw it make shock losses surmounting to almost a billion dollars. All that damage was done before the existing CEO's time. Ross Taylor has been in the seat since late 2017, with the intention of leading Fletcher's into a new era that delivers value for shareholders. So, is it? Well, Ross, thank you so much for your time. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. You've cut the dividend today. Your share price has dipped ever so slightly on this result. Do you think that you've improved the situation for Fletcher Building shareholders? So if I always look at the context we've got the company and the position we've got the company in. So if I step back and just briefly characterise the result this year, you know, our underlying profits are up, our margins are up, our return on funds is solid at 17%. And the dividend was down in expectations, but it was still a solid 34 cents for the whole year, which represents a 60% payout. Um, so, 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 so that's how I'd start. The disappointment in the year was the provisions we had to make on the convention centre as costs went above what the insurance proceeds will be. And that, is, and that hit, hit our, our, our after-tax earnings. The other thing I look at is just how we've positioned the company. It's really solidly positioned for performing through what will be a bit of a tighter market next year. But we're flagged with putting $800 million into growth, growth activities for the years beyond that. So I think we've got our business really well positioned to, to work through a bit of a tighter cycle and then really grow after that. I do want to talk to you about all of that, especially yeah. Sky City. But just on that tighter cycle, yeah. we're in a recession, high borrowing costs, still very high inflation. Talk me through how that's impacting all areas of your business and where it's possibly hurting most. Yeah, well, let's start 
was where, where I guess the, the front end of that, where we sell houses in the residential space. And, you know, we sold 617 houses last year, which was still pretty good in, in what was a tougher market. What we saw towards the end of last financial year, around about through April, May, June, and then what's continued in July, August, is people have got a lot more confident to buy houses. So we've seen volumes run at about 20 per week, you know, even through July and August so far this year. So that, that and we're also seen as prices stabilised. So, so we're, we're not giving away price anymore. So it feels like what the market commentators are saying is playing out in our business, that it, we've hit the bottom and, and it's stabilised. And it, when it starts growing from there, yet to see. But it gives us confidence that we think we'll sell about seven to 800 houses this year, up from last year, and maybe even more if we keep the, the volumes going the way they are. How does that specifically, that target, compare to what you were expecting? Because there was some Deloitte to Access Economics uh, work that you had done that showed that the value in your work put in place, specifically in residential in New Zealand, could fall, worst case scenario, by 16% this year, 14% next. I mean, how is that playing out? Is it better or worse than yeah, those so forecasts? What, so if I could move away from the residential business, because what, what then the residential activity generally impacts all of our other businesses. So how much are we selling you know, from our materials and distribution businesses? And what we saw through F, the, FY23, the last financial year, we saw about those volumes generally come up about 8%. And what we think we'll see this year is about the same again. And it's a sort of tale of two halves though. When you look at the non-residential and infrastructure, we think that'll be where it is now and possibly even grow because of the impacts of the rebuild from floods and cyclones. And the impacts on the residential still got a little bit of shrinking to do in terms of volume. So while the sales environment's stabilising, that hasn't quite flowed through to the volumes of houses that are being built. Yeah, how uncertain is that? I mean, we think house prices have found a floor. Obviously, we don't know yet. What's your working assumption for all of that? Um, well, working assumptions are very bad at predictions. So, so, but no, what we look at is we, we, we saw what happened last year and we look at economists and you, as you mentioned Deloitte, we, we really try and understand it. But then we actually see what are we seeing in the people buying houses that we're selling to? What are we seeing in the builders we sell to? What are all the market players saying? And that feels about right when we listen to that, and you sort of step right back. And then the other things, what is the interest rate cycle doing? Are people being able to get finance? And what's employment look like? You know, so employment's still very strong. So when you bake all that up, it feels about right. But but I can't, it, nothing's certain. No, it's certainly not. I'm taking from that, though, that you don't actually place much importance on economic forecasts. Do you more look at what you're actually seeing in your business? You do all of it. Um, but it, it's always dangerous when you run businesses to assume something's going to happen. So the way we, we try and understand the economists, we look at all the th our lead indicators, what our own committed work looks like, what our customers are saying, and then you always say, look, let's plan for the worst and... and, and hope and, for the best. Hope for the best. But, but, and, and you really want to do that because you don't want to you know, get that wrong. So, so I may sound a little bit cautious. I'm more optimistic than that, but we certainly... No, we've got a, uh, an important financial year to get through this year, uh, which will still be a bit softer in residential. I don't want to get ahead of myself. How about commercial? Is infrastructure fine? Yeah, look, what we're seeing in infrastructure is, is yeah, there's, there was the dynamic, it was busy anyway. And, and the unfortunate thing about the flood events and the cyclones, a lot of damage was done, and that's just up the ante. So, so, so that just puts more in the pipeline. And, and basically, you'd expect that to be a bit... Get, it'll take a little while for it to get busier because you've got to get the people and get set up and get organised, but I think that feels pretty solid for the medium term. Specifically on the flood, that's impacted some of your divisions as well. Give me some colour on what that looks like and is insurance covering those damages? There's probably two parts to it. Um, we cost us probably about 30 to 40 million in profit, so we made that much less because we inevitably when it's this wet as it gets you just don't trade people can't build so, so then we also had the impacts of damage and and so while a chunk of that's covered by insurance companies like us have quite a large excess so we have to carry the burden of a chunk of it ourselves or we choose to self-insure things so we don't insure everything that we think's small so there's probably 20 million of impact on that front as well so so yes it, it hurt us um, but but yeah, not much you can do about that. Talking about insurance, mm. the Sky City Convention Centre, when's Auckland getting one of those? Well, we've said several times, end of 2024 calendar year. So Is that still happening? That's when we believe we'll finish and that's what we're on target to do. And if I look at the way the program's running and the milestones we're achieving, I'm confident about that. And, and just as a, a few data points on the way, you know, we'll have 
all the car parks handed back to Sky City in the next month or so, and the hotel will be finished and handed back to Sky City by the end of this calendar year. So you're seeing real tangible um, progress on the site. So that just leaves then the convention centre proper itself to finish. And when it comes to the convention centre, what are those big tasks yet to do? I mean, does it still need a roof on it? Tangibly tell me sort of what are the, the, the items to tick off before it can be handed over? Getting it weather tight is, you know, so we talked about car parks is important as is the hotel, but then what you want is it weather tight? Because once you get it weather tight, and we've got it sealed up, but nice to be have the whole, what I call the external, and end of this year will be broadly weather tight. And that's really important because that gives you a really good front run at completing all the insides. The other really important thing for us in this is the steel remediation. So what occurred with the fire is, is the steel was either damaged or the fire rating paint around it was damaged. So we had to uncover all the steel, sandblast it all back, recoat it, and that has been an enormous undertaking. That's been a big reason for the cost just being a lot more than anyone expected because it's hard to understand how complex that was in a steel structure that was basically encased. So we'll be finished that as well by the end of this year. So we'll be in a much more normal construction uh, project to, fin to bring it home, basically. I hate to say it, but this has got to be the most cursed construction project. Would you agree with that? I don't. I might use words like that at home in my darkest You're welcome habit. to use them here. This is a safe space, no, Ross. No. Look, it's had its misfortunes, absolutely. And the thing is, that what I, what, what I love about it, though, is the team down there are really engaged in building a world class. They just really focus on that. And the energy down there is really great. So, yes, we, it's hurting us at, at the corporate level. But what I love is the energy down there and the passion that that team are bringing to getting a world class convention centre for Auckland. So it's quite palpable. So funnily enough, if I'm getting a bit down about it, I just go down there and spend time walking the job. I really mean it. it it's really the energy is really good. How often do you get down there? Once a month. Uh, it, it's an important project for us given the context of it so I just like to get down there and, and just be close to what the team's doing and how they're going. On my numbers, the napkin math shows me that it's officially now about a billion dollar project. Initially it was going to cost 750 mil, now with the extra provided cost going to cost just over 1 billion. Is that a correct assumption? Have I done the right maths? Order of magnitude. You're, you're close, yeah. And in the total delays, how many years are we talking? I mean I've sort of lost count but I think oh. it's about six. I, I'm, I'm something. I'm not sh actually sure, uh, and I don't. You know, we were. You know, it was already running behind program when the fire occurred. So exactly where it sits right now, and COVID. I don't know how it worked for you, but it sort of muddied up my timelines. Oh, yeah. You know, there's there's two years in there that I get a bit muddy as to what was going on when. But you know, so so. But order of magnitude again. I think you're probably right. So say it's let's call it a billion dollar project now. How much? is insurance going to cover? So you have two types of insurance, the contract works insurance, third party liability insurance. How much are you expecting to get from both of those? And how much have you actually got? Yeah, so of there's two parts of it, and we don't get, and we've sort of talked about left to go, but, but the contract works insurance has broadly been paid out because the costs are well in excess of it. So there's a few other bits we've got to work through, and there's about 100 million in that, which we declared at our investor day recently. Then there's the third party insurance, which is not the contractor, it's damages around that, which is the what we have, the accounting would not allow us to, to book, which was part of the extra provision. So we've got some very strong and large claims in there, but we just couldn't count on it. So what we have to do now, it's an, call it an opportunity in, a, in an accounting sense mm -hmm. that we will prosecute it. We have a good case and we expect to get yeah, returns out of that or, or, or money out of that, but we've just got to actually get it first. That's what I really want to know though, that expected amount. And this is, I think, where investors get a little bit confused because we don't actually know kind of how much you're going to fight for. So can you give us that number? It's in excess of 100 million. That's not much. Well, it depends who you are. I mean, well, I mean, if, if, if the provisions have been 255. Oh, we've, but we've, we've never said we'll get all those provisions back. Right. That was okay. not, no, so it was really, in that conversation, it was around the 105 million we made just before the full year results. The 150 we made back in December, so all up this year has been 255 provisions on the Convention Centre. We, we do not believe we'll get a large chunk of that back and we've never said we would. So there's an opportunity only around a portion of it um, and we've got significant claims on there and then it's a judgment as to how much they get and, and commercial judgments and accounting don't work like that. So accounting's factual. Is it certain? No, it's not. So it's not included. 
Okay, so when it comes to that 105 million that you are going to fight for, what is the sort of discrepancy in opinion that's going to cause you to potentially have to prosecute? Oh, we don't get into that. I mean, Can you hear? No, no, I won't. I mean, in the end of the day, we've, we, we, we've got to put the claims in. Whether we need to prosecute or go remains to be seen. All in all, is this officially an unprofitable project for Fletchers? Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, clearly we've made you know, a lot of provisions on it through the, um, through the last few years. Let's talk about building products. Are you still pushing price increases through on those? Um, there's, there'll always be here and there. I mean, and, and, and the reason I sort of say it like that is that if you look at our steel business, it's a merchant trading business. So that can go up and down regularly through the year. So as steel prices move around, they're always moving. But that's more as a distributor, as you're buying it offshore or those prices move through. Other than that, then, what you're generally dealing with is when costs go up, you, 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 you go to price and certain products go up and then some don't for a while, like wallboards or plasterboard, we didn't put up for 18 months and that's usually the cycle because we lock in supply contracts that might go for um, 18 months. So it just depends when those cost increases come through to us. So, so we'll see a little bit more of that through this year is my expectation, but nothing, I, I think it's staying to abate and, and time will tell, but I do think some of that cost increase pressure is coming out of the system and we'll have a good fix on that by the time we get through this year. Your margins are looking pretty healthy. Are you expecting those to, to keep rising? Yeah, we've talked about that in a couple of components. So if I look at our materials and distribution businesses, I, I don't think they'll rise, but I think they'll hold there or thereabouts. I expect them, because as volumes come off a little bit, that 8% I was talking about, we'll get a bit of compression, but I think we'll stay pretty close to where we are. Um, if I look at our residential business, I don't see a lot of price, or we're not assuming a lot of price upside opportunity, but there'll still be more costs. So I expect our residential um, sales margins to decrease through the year and we've flagged that for quite some time and I don't you know and, and when we start to see house prices go up again then that's when we'll start to see some expansion again and then construction will be similar to what it was this year. I'm not sure if you saw it but I recently did a piece about insider buying and skin in the game that executives have. It's a bit awkward to bring up your pay but I kind of don't really have a choice here. I know everything's fair in this game isn't it? Your short-term incentive has uplifted for the FY24. I'm interested to know if that actually drives you at all in this job? So what we did this year in, in 24 um, across the top team, you know, myself, executives and the general managers, is we gave no salary increases. Because <laughs> as we were coming into what we thought was a tighter year, we said, look, we're going to give no one a salary increase, but what we're going to do is if you hit, you perform, you get extra, extra bonus. So we didn't increase the overall bonus envelope, but we said if you get the, hit the targets we've set, you'll get an extra 10% at that target. And the idea of that is it's, it perform, you, know, it, you only pay it if we perform. So I get it if I perform. And, and I think that was a, a nice way of you know, keeping our costs under control, setting the tone from the top, and not take, you know, we, we still put 3.5% on average increases across our business, some more, you know, because inflation's real out there but we pushed it to where the people that needed it most and basically took a view with executives, perform and we'll pay. Does having a performance target drive you or do other things incentivize oh, no. you? I think myself and the large majority of executives turn out they're passionate about what they do and you want to succeed. Um, what I then would say though is that you, when you do succeed, you know, you, you, it, you want to be rewarded. So that's why I do like performance pay and if I look at my overall package only about 30% of its base the rest is performance and I think it's really appropriate as you get into senior roles because you're not yeah you pay to come to work fine but you should only really do well if if the business you're running is performing you know for investors and how do you think Fletcher is performing currently oh look I think as I said I think we had a really good year last year I, I think the the convention center is really frustrating um, and, and I, well, I think we're doing a good job to finish off. It's still hurting everybody, the business and shareholders, as we have to make those provisions. So, so I, I think it's a tale of two parts where if I look at the last five years and just where we've got Fletcher Building, it is really in a much nicer place. And I really like what it's doing, not only in its economic performance, but across safety, across sustainability, customer performance, employee engagement. So I, I'm really pleased with that, but we're still not clear of these legacy projects. So, so you know, th that, that's, that's the rub. You know, but I think as we get through the next 12 months, we should have been pretty well behind us. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Pleasure, Mary. I would so love to know what he calls that project behind closed doors, but I guess I'll just never find out.
Now, just a little disclosure on my relationship with Fletcher Building. My dad was the chief executive of its construction division between 2018 and 2022. Yeah, the man loves a challenge. I covered Fletcher before he got there, but then stepped away from it when he was involved. Now that he's gone, I'm glad to be back reporting on what I think is one of our most economically important businesses. Now go put your money to work. Thanks for watching Markets with Madison, the New Zealand Herald's show for interested investors. If you want to stay up to date with financial markets, click the subscribe button below and you can watch our other episodes here. Stay up to date with all the business news and numbers as they land on nzherald.co.nz.